Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, if you want to, feel free to drop your name and institution in the chat. Um, the chat goes directly to Regent staff, so we can kind of take care of the Q&A over here uh, without it blowing up on your screen the whole time. Uh, we will be recording. We have already started recording, and that will be available after the webinar. We'll get here started here in just a few minutes. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll get started here in another minute or two. Let people trickle in as their calendar reminders pop up. Uh, in the meantime, if you just want to drop your name and your institution in the chat, uh, the chat is uh, region staff is seeing the chat for today so that you don't see that bubble pop up on your screen the whole time um, and we'll manage questions through the chat. We are presently recording and the webinar will be recorded um, and distributed after. So you can share with your colleagues if needed. All right, we're here at 10.01. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we, as the Board of Regents staff, are gonna share with you our new prior learning assessment policy, go over some of the pieces of the policy and leave plenty of time for question and answer at the end. Uh, just a few housekeeping bits. We are in webinar format, which means that attendees um, are muted and off screen. We have, over 100 attendees today. Uh, that's just a good way for us to manage the conversation. If you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, Regent staff are gonna see the chat so that we can manage that process um, and so that it, the bubble isn't puffing up in front of you. We are recording and the recording will be available after. We'll make sure that all of you get that recording to share with colleagues if you need to. Um, I'm gonna do a brief, presentation. I'll introduce some of the region staff who are here today. And uh, then we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers. If there's things we can't get to today, we will follow up afterwards. So with that, 
Uh, first, I would like to introduce just quickly by name, my fellow Regent staff who are here today. Associate Commissioner Allison Bicknear, who works with us in academic affairs, Kim Langwa, uh, Tristan Denley's Executive Assistant, Lube La Madrid, Senior Policy Analyst, uh, and Melin Baker, Fellow Assistant Commissioner. Uh, so if you are welcome to contact any of us by email with questions on this, but at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Tristan Denley to walk us through the new policy. Jana, thanks so much. And Thanks everyone for, uh, for, for being on the webinar today. We're really excited to, to go through this new policy and uh, I know there'll be plenty of questions, but uh, initially I just wanna talk through at least uh, some of the, the, the major points about uh, of what is in this new policy around uh, credit for prior learning. So uh, first of all, sort of the, the, the why behind this. Uh, so of course, I think you all know that we have a, a statewide master planning goal to to reach 60th percent of our adult population having a credential of value by 2030. And to, to get to that place really requires, it really requires an all hands on deck kind of approach. It really is going to be the case that we cannot get to that goal simply by relying on traditional, the traditional college going population students who are coming out of high school and going on to college. We need to find all kinds of ways to re-engage uh, our adult population uh, folk who have perhaps been in the military or have been to college before and stepped out and we need to find ways to re-engage them. Uh, folk who uh, went straight to work and have significant work-based experience. And then, of course, it's also the case that uh, students uh, who are going through that traditional high school experience, many of them will have taken as part of that high school experience all kinds of early college experiences AP courses, uh, international baccalaureate courses, Cambridge courses, uh, uh, CLEP perhaps, uh, 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 CLEP exams, all kinds of ways in which learning can have happened outside traditional college classroom. And so we need to, to find a mechanism that really allows our campuses to recognize all of that learning and provide appropriate credit for it. And that's really what, uh, what this policy is all about. So what is prior learning assessment. So as, I, as I've said, prior learning assessment really is the evaluation and awarding of undergraduate college credit uh, the, in ways that that learning happens outside the traditional academic environment. So uh, in the policy, we, we do recognize the two flavors of prior learning assessment. First of all, standardized prior learning assessment. And by standardized, I really mean that there is a, an often national objective measure for, for the learning that has happened. So some examples around that are, uh, are, are AP courses, as I, I've already alluded, uh, CLEP exams. Actually, interestingly enough, uh, Louisiana is really one of the national leaders around uh, providing uh, CLEP, uh, CLEP credit for, for students when they, when they come to college. International baccalaureate uh, courses, uh, IBCs, those are industry-based certifications. Uh, DSST, that's uh, what, what, what used to be called Dante. So this is really uh, ways in which uh, credit can be awarded for uh, really using uh, ACE recommendations, the American uh, Council of Education, and then military exams and training. So these are all ways in which uh, credit can be awarded for specific, often nationally normed, kinds of exams or training. And for each of these kinds of uh, uh, prior learning assessments, there are national and statewide expectations as to how it is that, that credit should be awarded. A good example of this is for, for instance, for, uh, for AP, uh, we have a, 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 statewide, a statewide table that says if a student earns uh, a you know, particular score on an AP exam, then this is the, the credit which your campus is, uh, is expected to award for, uh, for that credit. So that's the standardized piece. Uh, the non-standardized is really recognizing that there's a whole other way, set of ways in which uh, credit can be, uh, can be awarded for prior learning. And the most, the, most, so the most obvious versions of that are twofold. The first is a, a campus exam. So a faculty developed institutional challenge exam. So that, that way, if a student comes on campus and wants to show that they really have 
the knowledge for college algebra or for a particular course on campus, then that often it's the case that faculty have developed an institutional challenge exam. Students can sure enough take that exam and then show that you know, often that exam is very similar to the, the final exam in that course. Students can take that, that exam and show sure enough that they already have all of the knowledge before uh, the, from, from, from some kinds of previous experiences that they had. Uh, the other uh, non-standardized way to be able to uh, provide credit for prior learning is the evaluation of a portfolio. And that really recognizes that uh, it, perhaps through some kind of life experience or, or work experience, the student may well have amassed some, some kind of collection of, of knowledge and skill and ability, which may actually translate into awardable credit. Uh, that student then creates a portfolio of evidence that shows that, as I say, as part of their professional or life experience, that they have, uh, have this set of knowledge, skill, and ability. And then that portfolio can then be evaluated by a faculty member who has expertise in that particular area and can sure enough recognize whether or not what it is that the student has done in the past really does, in fact, merit uh, awarding undergraduate credit. So uh, I've alluded to the fact that there is this evaluation. And so uh, one part of the policy is to, to provide an, 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 an across the board standardization as to how it is that, uh, that that evaluation should happen. And so do you wanna talk through those recommendations? So in the standardized piece, and I've already alluded to the fact that those standardized pieces are often nationally normed exams or often have uh, have national recommendations to be uh, to, for, for the, the, the awarding of that credit. And so that's the expectation that is played out in this policy that, for instance, for Dante's or military credit using the recommendations from the American Council of Education, the ACE, this is the, 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 the nationally recognized standard for those recommendations. And we expect campuses to follow those uh, the, those awarding principles. Similarly, for AP and for CLEP, we have the, the region's table, which guides, again, what kinds of credit for various scores on AP and CLEP would translate into credit-based uh, uh, credit undergraduate, undergra undergraduate coursework. On the, the non-standardized side, uh, again, the institutional exams, there is an expectation that those exams would be developed and evaluated by, by faculty who are credentialed uh, with expertise in that particular field. Of course, we would all recognize that we would expect those exams to be developed by, by, by faculty members in that particular area. And then again, for the evaluation of portfolios, again, we would also expect that faculty member to, to have appropriate uh, credentials, but also there are uh, this, this, this um, evaluation of a portfolio is really a uh, a very long established uh, practice. And there are uh, standards that have been set out for the, by the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, standards for the way in which those portfolios should be assessed. And again, those 10 standards for assessing learning are laid out in the, um, in, in the policy itself. And there is this expectation that campuses would follow would follow those principles when it comes to the evaluation of, uh, of those portfolios. So it's really important because one of the really important aspects of this policy is not only the awarding of credit, but also the transferability of credit. And so let me talk through that real quick. Uh, so first of all, where there, where there is this, um, uh, there is the principle that we are asking campuses when they award credit for prior learning, not to just simply award credit uh, that may well be um, uh, uh, just optional credit, or, or uh, but, but, but in fact, credit that really does, whenever possible, further a student's progress towards their degree. And so uh, when, it's a, when, it, when it is possible, we ask that campuses can provide uh, credit for courses that are actually part of the master course articulation matrix. This, those courses, these are generally general education courses. These courses are, uh, are, are a, really a, a set of courses that the statewide articulation and transfer council have agreed 
uh, are, are mutually transferable across all of our campuses. And so by awarding that credit, by awarding that credit, we really then provide credit for specific coursework, which could actually be counted towards a, a, a student's degree program and also can then be recognized campus by campus if a student were in fact able to move, uh, uh, needed to move and transfer from one campus to another. Now, of course, it won't always be the case that a campus is able to provide credit for a course that is on the uh, master course articulation matrix. We recognize that, but we certainly uh, encourage campuses if they're not able to provide that course credit uh, to instead uh, won't provide some you know, course credit for you know, for some other course that's not on the matrix. But 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 if if, if it's at all possible, providing the course coursework that's on the matrix is is to to the student's significant advantage. Uh, and that's really uh, doubly important based on the fact that. In the policy, we now ask that if, a, if one campus then provides that credit, provides credit for prior learning for a course that is part of the master course articulation matrix, that if a student then moves and transfers from one campus to a sister institution, that that, that, that course also transfers as part of their, uh, a part of their trans, uh, uh, transcribed credit that uh, uh, up until now, I think we, we all recognize that when a student has been awarded credit for prior learning by one campus, if they move to another campus, it isn't always the case that when they move to that other campus, that that credit for prior learning follows them. Often it's the case that the other campus has some, some other new set of criteria or some other way in which they might have judged PLA. This policy really streamlines all of that and now says when a student moves from one campus to another, that all of the all of the credit for prior learning that has been transcripted by one campus as part of the, uh, the the public sector here in Louisiana, all of those credits will then follow them and will be uh, transcribed as transfer credit when they get to the uh, to the to the transfer institution. Now, as you might imagine, to make all of that happen, we really need to make sure that there is a very great. Uh, uh, transparency of policy that underlines all of that, underline, uh, underlies it for all of our campuses to make sure that campuses recognize the way in which credit for prior learning is being awarded by sister institutions to assure them of really of the, uh, of, of really assure them of the standards that are being applied to award that credit, to assure them uh, of of the transferability of those courses, but also for students to understand the possibilities that are available to them uh, when it comes to credit for prior learning. And so again, really the last part of the board, the, the region's policy is really asking campuses, requiring campuses as part of their policy manual, uh, a set of really best practices when it comes to uh, the kinds of policies you need to have in place. So the, the, the first of those uh, institutional musts is really uh, guaranteeing timely and efficient evaluation of student requests. That uh, we, we do recognize that when students come to campus and they have perhaps a wide variety of different, different kinds of, uh, of, of previous experiences and different kinds of, uh, of, 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 of student scores, that it takes some time to be able to, to evaluate that on a campus. But we're really asking campuses to do that in an expeditious way. Uh, you can well imagine when a student first comes to a campus, it's really important for them to know what credit for prior learning that campus is able to provide to them so that, that they can know what courses they actually then need to take. And that may really be important when they are first arriving on campus to know, well, what courses should that be part of my fall or my spring or my upcoming semester's coursework. So we're asking campuses really to do this work in as expeditious a way as possible, recognizing that sometimes it may take some time. The evaluation of a portfolio may take some time. The creation of that portfolio may, uh, may, may take some time. Uh, we're asking campuses to really make sure that they incorporate credit for prior learning into their admission and advising practices. The, that it is often the case uh, uh, historically that when students come to campus, that they just simply are unaware of the possibilities 
uh, of, of the, that exist for them for credit for prior learning. Sometimes what needs to be done is sort of buried deep into the website. Sometimes perhaps initial advisors or admission officers are also maybe aware, but don't make it clear to students what kinds of opportunities there are for them around credit for prior learning. So we're simply asking uh, campuses to really make sure that they incorporate that well and clearly into the procedures that they have for admission and ongoing advising. And part of that really is uh, around the training of advisors and faculty members to make sure that they are aware of the various different possibilities that exist when it comes to prior learning, and also to make sure that faculty are well trained in the evaluation of these credits for prior learning. Uh, clearly, there is training that would need to be done uh, to just to make sure that faculty members are prepared to do the kinds of portfolio assessment that's required as part of this work. On the flip side, it's it's a sort of a, a really important and subtle point that when students are offered credit for prior learning, uh, they don't always have to accept it, and that's a really important aspect of this. It, it, it can happen that a student uh, perhaps is, uh, uh, is actually eligible for credit. Perhaps they have a, a four on an AP exam, which would actually provide them the opportunity to have credit for a calculus class or a freshman biology class or whatever. That, that may be possible. It may be that the, the, they are offered some kind of elective credit for a uh, for uh, for military training that they did, or perhaps some course credit for military training that they did. That that offer on behalf of the campus, since this is credit for prior learning, is not required. It is an option for the students to accept that. And so there are specific instances where once the student actually gets into their program, that it may become the, the, the case that they, the, that they should not, in fact, have accepted that, uh, that credit for prior learning. It can happen, for instance, if a student goes to some medical schools that they simply don't accept uh, credit for uh, AP, an AP calculus exam, for instance, uh, that, 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 that that college may well have awarded. And so that student may, after the fact, realize, you know what, actually to make appropriate academic progress to go in the direction that I need to, to meet the requirements that I need to, that I need to now retrospectively go back to the campus and say, I know that I agreed to accept these credits for prior learning, but I've changed my mind. I would now like to have to, to retrospectively withdraw uh, that permission to transcript that credit for prior learning. Uh, this is an important aspect of this. It sometimes can have impl implication when it comes to financial aid eligibility, and it certainly might have implications when it comes to various different kinds of uh, graduate school or, or professional school uh, possibilities. So allowing that possibility that for a student to retrospectively refuse or ask for the removal of that credit from prior learning from their transcript is an important and subtle aspect of this. And then the last is really to recognize, to make sure that as we do the evaluation of students when they are admitted, especially those who have come from various, uh, various parts of the armed forces, that we really do make it a, 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 an incorporated practice to look at uh, the JST and DD14 and another transcripts from uh, from the community college of the Air Force and the Coast Guard in Institute and other kinds of uh, uh, other kinds of transcripts that especially our military population have, making sure that that is part and parcel of our standard practice rather than perhaps something that is an afterthought or or evaluated by request. So I think that's really summarizing all of the pieces of the policy, and uh, and I'll be happy to to now answer any questions that you have. I know that there's been, seen that there's been a, a several questions coming in and hopefully my folk will be able to kind of take the theme of those so we can make sure that we can answer as many as we can. Yeah, Tristan, can you um, describe more for the group the um, portfolio process and how they would maybe um, evaluate someone who comes in with a lot of public speaking experience and how that can translate into credit for speech 1010 communications? Yeah, so, 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 so when it comes to the evaluation of portfolio work, 
certainly this is there is no sort of set in stone this is this equals that but the uh the the the, the, the cancerful adult education kale really has set out a set of very established practices i mean believe kale's have been in uh in existence for more than 50 years and and so really recognizing how it is that those there are, there are good best practices to enable those students to actually put together that portfolio that establishes evidence of their learning and there are good uh, established best practices as to how faculty members might then go about actually evaluating the evidence that is part of those portfolios and i know we are looking to to create uh, future webinar pro professional development experiences for for faculty and staff across the across the state to be really be, be able to, to know well, what those best practices are and how best they might be implemented. Similarly, there are established best practices about how it is that we can help students know how do you go about actually even creating those portfolios. And so I really uh, look to, 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 to being able to provide that kind of, uh, that kind of experience across the state uh, over the, the coming months and years. Thanks. Okay. Um, another one is in regards to ACE military guide and transferring those credits. The question is, um, should they automatically use the ACE military guide for transfer credit or will it, is it simply to be used as a guide for the faculty and deans to use or do they accept it as it is through ACE? So the, the really the expectation is that people will use the ACE recommendations as a guide. Uh, really what we're asking is that, so we're asking that when, when the evaluation of those credits is done, that they are done according to those best practices. That way, when a sister institution asks uh, uh, or uh, is put in the position of transferring that credit, they can really be, you know, they can know, well, the way in which that credit was awarded was in line with national expectations, the national recommendations that ACE provides. We're not we're not requiring that campuses, we're not requiring campuses, if ACE says this, then you must award that. But our expectation is that if you were to award it, then, the, then what you award aligns with the recommendations that, for instance, the, the ACE provides. Um, and next is a very sp more specific question of when you're transcribing the credit from one institution that's granted the PLA, PLA credit, such as the CLEP, um, how do are they to enter it, the transfer work on their transcripts? Are they supposed to enter it in as the transfer work or as from CLEP from the other institution? Uh, so the, the the policy actually asks that when it's uh, the when it's transfer that it's treated as transfer credit. Okay, and we've been asked to provide a link to our statewide AP and CLEP scores, and we can go ahead and add that. Yeah. Um, and send that to you guys. Um, we have several questions regarding training and opportunities for training. Will we um, provide CALE certification training and any other training for regents from regents for, um, for faculty regarding PLA and the awarding of PLA? Yeah, and I, I mean, in many ways, this is part and parcel of what we were hoping to gather from today. And uh, I think we anticipated that there really would be uh, a um, uh, a desire for ongoing training, as, as, as you say, both from, from Kale, but also in, in other areas of PLA. And we are certainly very interested and keen in being able to make available that kind of training to faculty and staff all across the state, not only in the coming months, but on an ongoing basis, because the reality is that uh, this policy, we hope, will now be a very vibrant part of our, uh, our statewide picture. Right. And when referring to sister institutions, we are to be known that we are referring not only to institutions within your system, but statewide from public institution to public institution, all institutions. That's right. So the so the uh, the, the, the the policy framework that we put in place uh, really governs all of the Board of Regents institutions from the from from the four state public systems. Uh, it, it is the case that some of our LACU institutions are also uh, interested in being part of that family. And so we certainly encourage that they also will, uh, will, will recognize this transferability. And also we would encourage our campuses to, uh, when those LACU schools follow those same kinds of standards for award and credit, that they would sure enough recognize those in the same way that they would from the public institutions. 
but it's the public institutions that are governed by this policy structure. Okay. Can you speak a little more in regards to removing the PLA credit to be withdrawn from the transcript? Yeah, so this is really recognizing that, uh, as I say, when a, let me give the, the example of a student who uh, first arrives on campus and maybe they got a four for uh, AP biology. And on that campus, that four for AP biology may in fact allow that student to, for want of a better word, cash that credit in for credit for uh, majors biology one. Or, or let's imagine that scenario. There may be situations where that student actually does not in fact want to take that AP credit, but in fact, instead prefers to take that college course for a grade. There's a variety of different reasons why that might be the case. And so on, on, on every campus, there has historically been a process for that student to say, you know what, I don't want to have that credit. I don't want to have that credit transcript uh, transcripted. I prefer to take the, the to take the course. But the, the scenario that I'm the, the, that's envisaged in the in the policy is that the, the, that decision is not is really not immutable. That decision that the student makes is not irrevocable. That when that student decides, you know what, I actually would like to have credit uh, that AP course recognized or this military course recognized for this particular course credit, that later in their academic career, maybe they change to a different major, uh, maybe some other situation has arisen, they can go back and revisit that, that decision and say, I would like to now formally request to rescind that permission to, to, to reverse my decision to accept that credit and instead to have that credit that was provided to me for credit for prior learning removed from my transcript. It really recognizing that it's a really, it's a sort of a, a retroactive refusal of that credit, it's less than it being, I think, you know, we, we all get a little, a little uncomfortable in transcripted credit being removed, but this is a this is a very special kind of transcripted credit, and so it's really recognizing that 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 decision that the student makes is not irrevocable. They can, in the future, say, "I I, I changed my mind. I don't want to, to to have that credit on my transcript." Question regarding if an institution currently cannot take a departmental exam or a CLEP after attempting a course. Does this new policy override that institutional policy? No, it does not. It doesn't override that institutional policy. Uh, one more question about the transcript uh, credits removal. Um, would this be done on um, an individual basis or is it all or none? So specific courses are all or none? Yeah, so it's anticipated to be an, a, a course by course decision. Uh, as I say, it, it, it could well be that there are, you know, especially in the, let's say in the, uh, the, 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 the AP example that I gave, it could well be that there is advantage to the student accepting this particular AP credit and disadvantage to them accepting that. And so it's to be done on a course by course basis. Okay. And let's see, in regards to data collection, we're having questions um, regarding the student profile and if there will be new codes to um, meet those requirements and for us to track code, as, uh, let's see more specifically, level so that these students do not have to be counted or coded as exceptions. Yeah, so that's a, that's a terrific point. I really thank somebody for asking the question about data. So in the policy, we do allude to uh, new data collection that will be coming to the Board of Regents that, that really will, will recognize this kind of credit and allow uh, allow us to be able to 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 assess the uh, the effectiveness of this strategy. Um, there will be new codes and there will be new procedures and practices for the gathering of that credit. Uh, those uh, the, the, those new codes are, are yet to be established, and there will be a, a future webinar about exactly how it is that uh, the, this credit will be um, will be part of the data gathering, uh, um, uh, the, the ongoing data gathering that comes from campuses to the Board of Regents. Okay, um, this may be more detailed than we wanna get in today, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Um, for AP classes that are accepted by some universities, but not others, 
are the number of hours awarded um, that are sp specific to the class and the credit hours vary. Do they accept the other school's posted credit or would they post the credit arrived as it arrived to them directly? So if I think I'm understanding if they receive AP scores directly to that institution, but it's already on the transcript, which do they? So I think we, so we would ask that you transfer the course in the way that you would normally transfer the course. So, so I think this is the this is the the, the way that we understand this that uh, that, that in the uh, in the, uh, the the articulation matrix, let's say maybe calculus is I seem to be using calculus as an example of this. If a student let's say is given credit for AP calculus at this particular institution, then maybe that trends translates into their having credit for this particular course, uh, which is part of the matrix on this campus. When they move to the, the sister institution, transfer the course credit in the way that you would normally transfer it. So you have an established practice as to how it is that that calculus course would normally have been transferred, transfer it like that. Okay, well, I think that uh, we may have a few more detailed questions, but we're going to, we have recorded um, capturing the chat and we will reach out to any institutions directly with any specific questions um, regarding their processes. And or, uh, one last call for any other questions that we might have for Dr. Denley or the group today. Um, we are capturing all of your questions in the chat. We'll make sure to either write back directly to you or if we missed broader questions, uh, we'll send clarification. This is really gonna help us develop an FAQ. Uh, we will follow up later, see what kind of training and professional development opportunities we can support you with. Uh, again, feel free to email any of us. I will follow up. To those of you who were in attendance with the webinar link, you are welcome to pass that along to anyone and everyone who you think could benefit from this information. We'll have it posted with the policy uh, once it's ready. And I think that'll be it. Uh, thank you all so much for joining and for Dr. Denley uh, for working with us on bringing this to the finish line. We think it's gonna be great for students. So let us know if you have additional questions. Uh, we are having, for those of you who are interested, the webinar on the new placement policy is tomorrow, same time, different place. You should have a link mm -hmm. on your calendar uh, with the Zoom link and password for tomorrow's webinar. Please feel free to pass that along also to anyone and everyone. We'll be working in the same format. So thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye. Have a great day, everyone.